coming up on Broncos Training Camp 2022 with Steve Atwater. It's the first Friday of Broncos Camp, and the fans are back in full force to get a glimpse of their new look Denver Broncos. Hat tip to those parents for getting their little ones in orange and blue before they can even walk. Of course, Dalton Reisner, Quinn Miners, Greg Dulcich, a couple of guys who got out here early today in order to start warming up. And we are so excited to have our special guest, Derek Wolf, with us today. He spent some time with his adoring fans, and his adorable daughter, and his arms this morning. We've got all your day three training camp coverage coming up right now. Welcome to Broncos Training Camp 2022 with Steve Atwater. Here's your host, Alexis Perry. Thanks so much for joining us for Broncos Training Camp 2022 with Steve Atwater. I'm Alexis Perry, and I'm so thrilled to be joined by a familiar voice on KOA Radio and a familiar face here on the Broncos Digital Channels. Of course, Ryan Edwards from Broncos Country tonight. Ryan, thanks so much for being here. Excited to be here. Appreciate it. Yeah, we're going to send things up here to Steve Atwater and Derek Wolf here in just a little bit. But first, Ryan, this is your 13th training camp here with the Denver Broncos. So it's safe to say that you've really seen it all when it comes to how these practices are structured. Now, Nathaniel Hackett, he is a first time head coach. So we know he spent the offseason meticulously planning and detailing every minute of these practices. So how would you say these compare to those in years past? Yeah. It it's a little bit different, and every single coach has a, a bit of a different flavor on what they're trying to do. The, the biggest thing that jumped out right away is, is, first of all, the emphasis on situational football. Russell Wilson even acknowledged it, saying it felt more like playing a game out here during practice. And, you know, we're so used to seeing skeleton, which is like seven on seven, yeah. right? We're not seeing any of that. Uh, we're so used to seeing individual drills, DBs versus cornerbacks. We're not seeing any of that either. And so it's a lot more team emphasis. It's a lot more game situation emphasis. You're seeing a lot of red zone work. You're seeing, hey, we have third down. It's it's competition out there. Defense, you got to get a stop. Offense, you got to convert this third down. And I also love the way Nathaniel Hackett is sort of ending practice. He's ending it on these really high swings. Yes. So yesterday, ending practice on the pass or tan pass breakup on Cortland Sutton. The day before, a goal line stand. Whether the offense got it or not, it's been debated. But goal line stand, these yep. intense competition moments is really great. You know, unfortunately, there are a handful of guys who will not be able to be out here participating in these drills and practices because they are on the physically unable to perform list. Of course, those guys, still Randy Gregory, Billy Turner, KJ Hamler, and Tom Compton. Also, working exclusively on the side, not on the pup list, is tight end Greg Dulcich. You know, while everyone hopes to see these guys sooner rather than later, Ryan, who are some of the guys who are taking advantage of the extra reps they're being given right now? Well, I mean, the first one you have to start with is Calvin Anderson, right? I mean, he's going to be, he was going to be in a competition for right tackle. There's still a competition for right tackle, but he's exclusively working there as a starter at right tackle right now because it was expected to be Billy Turner and maybe a bit of Tom Compton. Well, that's just not the case. These are a huge opportunities for him, and he's had all off season for this opportunity. Next one up is Eric Salbert, right? Yes. Because he was a guy they brought in kind of late in the process. In fact, Eric Tomlinson was brought in before that. But they brought in Salbert later, a guy who was here last year, and he's got three touchdowns in two days. And so you want to talk about making the most of your opportunity. You thought that one late was a touchdown yesterday? Absolutely. Oh, I thought he was no tackled. No question about it. I thought it. he was tackled early. All I right. also loved his point that he brought up. He said, we're an office now that hates when we don't score yes. versus loves when we score. So Eric Salbert absolutely is one of those guys. And I'll throw in Montreal Washington. Yes. Uh, he's right now ticketed to be one of the top returners. He's going to be competing for that. But he's getting some time with the first team offense as well in a bit of that KJ Hamler role. So for me, I look at those guys and I say, hey, this is it. You you know, you know, have a finite amount of time to prove your abilities, to prove your exactly. opportunity, and they're all doing it. Well, I think it's safe to say that the defense as a whole, they are taking advantage of the opportunity to go up against a nine-time Pro Bowl quarterback in practice each and every day. Well, I think this is a team-first mentality right now, do you think this defense has kind of a collective chip on its shoulder right now? It feels like it might. Well, there's no question about it, really, because I, and I've talked to him all off season. In fact, I talked to Michael Ojibudia yesterday, and uh, his response very quickly, big smile on his face. He's like, I don't know why people keep forgetting about this defense. We've been carrying this team. So uh, the defense, 100%. They hear everybody talking about Russell Wilson, talking about all these offensive weapons, and I know they're excited about that for the season, but no question, they want to be the identity of this team. They want to remain the identity of this team, and uh, you're seeing it every single day in practice. We're used to the defense chirping, the offense chirping back now, and they have good reason to, but yes, 100%, the defense, 
they want to make their mark and they're doing it early. Something that I've learned a little bit more about as of late when I met up with defensive line coach Marcus Dixon is the identity of the defensive line. Take a listen. Coach, you spent one season with the LA Rams, won a Super Bowl with Coach E's defense. Obviously, you take the reins over here in Denver. What are some of the key attributes of Coach E's defense and what your guys are doing within that? Uh, for us, is uh, first of all, it was a blessing. I mean, it's getting a Super Bowl ring and we're all connected for life. Uh, but with Coach E's defense, it's, it's really about being multiple in, in our front um, and, and using the, the talent that we have with the guys and putting them in the best position to win but also listen to the guys, getting their input, because at the end of the day, it's, it's his defense. It is what it is, but he also tells, like, it's all of us collectively. Yeah. So we want to get the best answers, put the best guys in the best positions, and, and the guys are buying into it, and it's been awesome so far. It is not uncommon for there to be kind of subcultures within these position groups. You know, the RDA gang, that's something that we know well here with the wide receivers. But your group, it's the dark side. Can you tell us a little bit more about this dark side brand and how your guys are buying in? Oh, yeah, so they buy into it. This is something that started when I was a rookie, uh, when I was back with the Cowboys and Marcus Spears, uh, Jay Ratliff, Chris Canty, and we kind of started the dark side. And over the years, I kind of just added to it. And it's really just buying into it and understanding that I'm going to take pride in working when no one is watching. Like, I'm going dark. And when the lights come on, you'll see all the work I put in. So the, the, just to uh, sum it up and make it simple, just work. just work. Don't worry about who's watching. Just go to work. Some of the guys that are working for you, what, have impre what has impressed you most about your group of guys? Their love for one another, how they encourage each other, how they come out here every day wanting to get better uh, pre-practice. I mean, post-practice they work on stuff, the film study, um, how they, the, the older guys are coaching the vets. That's a lot of the things you like to see. Uh, they're not shying away from the work in individual because my indie drills, they're tough. It's hard. That's how we hone in our techniques and fundamentals. That's how we get our conditioning in. And, I mean, they're running to the ball, and it's, you can tell it's contagious to the position groups. Well, I know your guys would rather be in full pads, given the fact that they are in the trenches. But what are you looking for in evaluating during these lighter practice days? Like I was just talking about with the techniques and fundamentals, like uh, understanding, first of all, understanding the defense, uh, the ins and outs of it, the ins and outs of it, um, the hand placement, the pad level. And, of course, you can't be as physical because we don't have pads on. Uh, we get all of that. But uh, in that and then, and then the burst after the plays, you know, chasing the ball down and it's being locked in the whole time. Coach, thank you so much for the time. We really appreciate it. No problem. I appreciate you. Thank you. So great to have the opportunity to get to know some of these coaches a little bit more during this time. Ryan, what's your initial impression of this defensive line? Uh, they're very good, and I think the addition of DJ Jones is going to be just unbelievable yes. for this team. Last year, the defensive, the interior defensive line gave up 4.8 yards per carry on the ground, and we saw that. They couldn't close out games against Cleveland, against the Raiders. When they needed to get a stop, they just had a difficult yeah. time stopping the run. DJ Jones is going to be so great. Draymond Jones, of course, we already know he's super talented, super fast. Uh, I think having Mike Purcell back, healthy. I love the addition of Inioma Wazirike, who's yeah. basically got tree trunks for arms. <laughs> so I, I really think that the interior of the defensive line's in, in a really good spot. And the whole point of the interior defensive line is to really open up things for the pass rush, exactly. to allow those guys get to get back there and inf impact the quarterback. So I, I'm excited about him. And of course, stopping the run is a huge priority for this defense. Marcus Dixon, he actually helped coach the six best rushing defense in the league last year there with the LA Rams as he was able to then hoist the Lombardi trophy there at the end of the season. Somebody else who knows something about putting together a really successful career on the defensive line that is our special guest today former defensive end Derek Wolf who just announced his retirement from the league this morning. The Super Bowl 50 champion is known for his toughness, relentlessness and dedication to the game as he fought his way through nagging injuries throughout his career but still racked up 34 sacks 350 tackles and 122 games. The Broncos could not be more excited for Derek as he begins the next chapter of his life as a full-time family man dedicated to his amazing wife, Abigail, and two beautiful daughters, Tatum and Roxy. Steve, let's send it up to you. Oh, man, thanks so much, Alexis. I'm honored to be joined by my man, D. Wolf, here. We're still having a great conversation uh, and watching these guys uh, get going here. So, Derek, congratulations again, man, on a great career. Um, what does this mean to you, man, to, to finish it up and, you know, be here to, you know, get a chance to let Broncos country thank you for all the joy that you brought them? You know, man, I, I really wanted to retire at Bronco. Like, that was a, you know, from early in my career, I was like, man, I want to retire here. You know, because the fan, it's the fans. It's the people in this city that they show so much love and they show me so much love. And the patience that they showed me through the injuries that I had to battle through because, 
you know, I, I was always going to play hard, and I was always going to try to come back from everything that happened to me. And I was always going to play through things. And they always appreciated that, and they always recognized that. So I always appreciated that love. And from the day I stepped into this building, I was treated like family. Yeah. From the whole city, the organization, everything. So when I left and went to Baltimore, I was, uh, you know, it was bittersweet. I was, uh, I was kind of, you know, I was kind of angry about it, you know. But it's a business, and even though I, I used to say it all the time, it's a business, you know, that's a business. And then when it happens to you, you're like, no, I, you know, it's no, this ain't a big, it's personal, you know. Right. So I tried to, I, I didn't take it personal though, but I was just upset. But oh, you went that you went you went yeah, through that too. Yeah, um, after my tenth year, you know, I kind of knew it was coming because they started taking me out of out of on the defense uh, during different series and that. So I had a feeling it was going to happen, but I finally got the call. And but I, I wasn't upset though. Uh, I, I was kind of like you. I kind of I know I knew it. I know it comes to an end at some point. Uh, I had some great relationships, and you know, I just didn't want to ruin that. So uh, yeah, but I, I understand what you went through there and. Uh, you know, you're here now, though, so yeah, that's, that's the now. big thing. And uh, it was, it, and I'll tell you, it was tough the way it went out because I was having in 2019, I was actually having my best season. Right. Year eight, I was having my best season, and then on a dead play that should have never happened, I dislocated my elbow. Yes, I remember my that. own teammate. Yeah. And I went in the locker room, threw a fit. And I was mad. You know, tossed a helmet, kicking benches, <laughs> and uh, you know, but it was, it was, I was miserable, man. I was, I was so upset. And then COVID hit, and it was like, well. You know, I did all my rehab here and everything, and you know, they, I, they just kind of made it clear, like, hey, we, you know, it's it's time to move on. We want to move on. You know, I felt like they were trying to kind of move on from all those guys from the Super Bowl Fifty team. You know, it was like we're just kind of trying to like get a fresh start. You know what oh, I mean? Oh man, that's a, that's a crappy feeling. Man. Yeah, and it was a tough yeah. feeling, but I was still like, you know, super grateful for everything that they did for yeah. me because you know, from you know, I was paralyzed in 2013. And they didn't give up on me then. The neck, yeah. yeah, they didn't give up on me then. You know, I had a suspension in 2015. They didn't give up on me then. Uh, you know, I, I had to get a neck surgery in 2017. They didn't give up on me then. Yeah. So you know, they they stuck by me, and uh, you know, I'll forever be grateful for that. And I'm just super honored to be able to retire a Bronco because it was really important to me. I actually was thinking, like, hopefully, you know, hope when I'm done with the Ravens, I'll get to go back and play another year or two yeah. with the Broncos. But. It just uh, wasn't in the cards for me. My, you know, my hips and stuff are just you know, tore up. And yeah, your body will tell you. It'll, it'll let you know. Yeah. So, Derek, um, what, what were some of your favorite times? What would you say is your, your I think two or three favorite memories that you have of, of, of playing here with the Broncos? I mean, winning a Super Bowl is just that like, got to be the top you know, of the list. I mean, that's, what a surreal moment, you know. You don't have a bling on. I didn't. Wear, I don't wear it, man, because I just like, I just I don't know. I feel weird wearing it, like. Like I'm asking for attention, you know. And I used to, I used to like attention. Now I don't like attention. Well, I, I, just, I don't think it's more for attention. But I, I think like when you go in different environments. I know. This, I my, this, this is my take on it. It may not be, you know. Everybody has their own few views on it, but I feel like, you know, when you're out, people know who you are. It's not like you can hide. Like, oh yeah. man, that's 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 not Derek Wolf. That's Derek Wolf. Yeah. <laughs> and they, you know, and if they're gonna come up to you. Give, you know, just an opportunity to for them to see it, you know. Yeah, people yeah. want to see it, you know. People do like to see it, and I, I just think I don't wear it as much as I should. And I, you know, why? It's because I conditioned myself after I won that ring that I was going to win another one. So I was like, this is going to be something that's like not. It's the first one. I mean, yeah. Next thing you know, I'm like, oh, I'm retiring, and I don't have another one. So yeah. I'm like, yeah, yeah. all right, I got to cherish the one I got. You oh know, yeah, dust that joke off more. a little bit. Yeah, huh? I better go ahead, <laughs> go ahead and wipe this thing off. You know, it's got some <laughs> dust on it in the safe. I keep it in the safe, you know. And you know, I do. I bring it like. Uh, in the last two seasons, like we're doing all our virtual meetings. I would keep that ring out in front of me, yeah. So I'd see it every time. So it was like that's my. You know, I want to get back to that feeling, because it's like a drug. It's like chasing a drug high, you know. Like yeah. winning that Super Bowl is like a drug high, because there's nothing like it. Wow. There's no comparison to it. Yeah. So once, and, you know, you got a guy like Tom Brady who just keeps on winning them. It's unreal. It's I'm like, man, I would love to have known what that feels like to just. This guy's played, like more seasons in the post uh, postseason you know what i mean yeah, those games in the postseasons <laughs> add up to 10 years <laughs> right <laughs> like it's just crazy to me that a guy like that can do it so you know just to win one man i'm super grateful and that's definitely my my top moment you know but I, countless moments of being in the locker room and just goofing around you know what yes. I mean, with the guys is like and that's all i remember when i was younger guys would be like oh you gotta cherish the moments in the locker room I'd be like yeah whatever like you know, but now that I'm like done with it and I'm not gonna be back in that locker room, it's like I walked in there today and I was like, man, I miss just like being in here before practice and being like, man, it's hot today. Or, you know, That's right. You know, just like trying to be the who's gonna be the guy that brings the energy today? You know, and goof around and try to get to get it lightened up because you know how the dog days get in camp. You know, oh, once yeah. you get into like you know week three of camp, you're like 
to do. Get me so, out of this hotel. Yes. You know, get me back home. I miss my kids. I miss my wife. Now, right. now, do you guys have a group chat like you with uh, the rest of your, your your teammates, some of your former teammates? I, I mean, there's a there's a, a couple of us that still talk, but it, you know how it is, man. People go their separate ways and do their own thing and other teams and stuff. But I still talk to a lot of those guys. There's no like real big group chat, you know, yeah. anymore. But there used to be though. Yeah. And we used to be on that, but it kind of just faded away, you know. As, as you get older, hopefully it'll it'll come back. And I, we found, I guess. We got probably 20, 25 guys in our group chat now. And See, it's, that's cool. You know, over the years, it's just we add another guy in, and uh, it's just cool to kind of keep keep in touch with everybody, see how everybody's doing. Yeah. You know, somebody have a joke or something, they'll put it in there. It's, it's, it's kind of cool. Yeah. I'm sure when we got, you know, they'll do like a reunion. We'll, get, we'll all get back together and figure it out. But, you know, right now it's just everybody's kind of got their own thing going on. And, you know, but, but for the most part, I talk to, a, you know, probably half those guys still. You know, I talk to d all the time. I talk to, you know, Peyton texted me this morning. I get to see him around town a lot. And I talk to Vaughn still. And TJ Ward used to live next door. He moved back to California, though. Oh, did he? But, yeah, you know, I saw him. I got to see him all the time. Uh, you know, countless guys. You know, you know, I yeah. talk to Malik all the time, too. You know, Danny Trevathan. You know, we still – Akeeb. Yeah. Chris Harris. You know, yeah. we still we still talk. We just don't have a big group chat, you know, where we all get to talk together. That's actually a good idea. We might have to do something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, that would be a good idea. Yeah, let's let's check out these guys. So, man, D. Wolf, you got a championship. What do you see in this team? Is, is, is there any chances for this team to win a championship? I, I we we talked got, a little bit about it. What's the first thing that they got? They got Russell Wilson. <laughs> right. I mean, you got that. You got that quarterback. That it factor quarterback. Not just a, a good quarterback. You have a great quarterback. Right. You know, Russell and I actually came in to the league together. Wow. So we were, at, you know, at the combine. We got to know each other, and I played against him. In college, I played against him when he was at uh, uh, North Carolina State. No way. And I was like, who is this guy? Yeah. You know? Cause we was he the same way in college? Oh, it, awful to play against. Awful. He was oh, all over the place. Man. Um, but he just, like, you know, his attitude and his the leadership he brings and his, you know, he's always being positive. Has he know? always been like that? Because I've, I've seen some interviews with him, inter- you know, inter- well, interviews and little spots of him interacting with the players and just he, his positivity, his his leadership, all of that is just, it's amazing. And I'm wondering, has he always been like that? The first time I met him when, you know, we were, you know, 20 years old, 21 years old, you know, he was, I was like, man, this guy actually, he's, you know, really grown. You know, he don't act like a, a fresh out of college guy. He acts like he's a guy that wants to go win Super Bowls. Yeah. And he did. You know, wow. you know he's, and he's a, he's got that, and sometimes something like this, going to another team and getting a fresh start is good. Yep. It's what a guy needs. I mean, look what it did for Peyton. That's right. He plays, plays best football. Yeah. You know, and this guy this guy has it. Yeah, and I think with Peyton's situation with his neck, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, if I was in, I still wouldn't have given up on him. There's no way I'm letting Peyton Manning go. But, no. You know. Never. Never. Never, ever. I would have never let Russell Wilson go. No, same here. I'm like, hey, George, George Peyton, man, I don't know how he pulled that one off. But, hey. Our hats off to him. And yeah, we're, we're I'm glad happy. he did. We're, we're happy that he's here. I wish he'd have done it a little sooner. <laughs> when I was here. <laughs> no offense against the guys that were playing quarterback for us, but yeah, we see Russ here uh, playing against the, the Steelers. There, man, we're going to see some of those beautiful passes this year as well. He drops it right in the butt. Yeah. All right, so let's let's talk about some of these guys on the team here the, on on the defensive line here. Um, now you played defensive line, defensive end. Well, I played. De- I played. You played interior. I played stuff three too. tech, mostly three tech. Oh, technique. okay, okay. They call me a DN, and that's where I got. You that's where I, yeah. That's where I kind of got gypped on the uh, Pro oh, Bowls pro, and stuff because right. I, I'm, I'm competing against Joey Bosa, Cleo Mack, and D. Ware, yeah. Vaughn, Elvis. You know, what I mean, I'm I, no, I'm a three technique. Like, right. But I, I'm a DN because we ran a three four. You know what I mean? And our base defense. I, so you got a nose, and then you got two yeah. two th- four techniques. Head yeah. Up. So that that ain't a position to be rushing a passer, I'll tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Well let me let me ask this. At 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 your height, okay, we got, got look at the whole defensive line here, Mike Purcell there, EJ Jones coming over from San Fran, Draymond Jones in his fourth year, Deshaun Williams, McTelvin Aguim. Uh all these guys playmaker, Jonathan Harris here, second year, Marquis Spencer, Jonathan Congo. I think it's Congo. <laughs> Matt Matt Henningson. Uh, he's the rookie, and then uh, Iyoma Uwazarike. That was impressive. I, I that practiced. Was impressive, yeah. That was impressive. <laughs> There's my boy Mike, though. Yeah, Mike Purcell. That's my dog. Yes. I still talk to Mike a lot. Yes. Mike, 6'3", 328. I was going to ask you about height. Mike dislocated height. my elbow. No, he's the one who did it. Yes. He took it. He, he tried to jump he, over me. Oh. 
I said, Mike, why did you try to jump over me? He's like, I'm so sorry, bro. I'm so sorry. <laughs> He's like, he felt bad. He felt so bad about it. I was like, bro, it's football, man. It's, don't feel bad. Yeah. But at your height, six, six, five, six, six. Six, six. Six, come on, man. Wow. Six, six. Do you feel like that was an advantage for you, or did sometimes you feel like it was a disadvantage being on the interior defensive line? Sometimes, some, a lot of times, it was an advantage in a lot of ways, and then it's, and it's, like I felt like the pass rushing aspect of it, it was kind of a disadvantage because I couldn't squeeze through and sneak through, like get real skinny, because to get skinny, I had to get tall. Yeah. And when you get tall, you get pushed. Right. And when you get pushed, you're out of your lane and all that stuff. So, but staying low in the run game and stuff. I was a wrestler in high school, you know what I mean? Like, I had to understand leverage and how to body position. Right. So that helped me. But I think in a pass rush sometimes it would kind of, like, interior rot rushing-wise, it kind of limited me to some of the things I could do because I didn't have as much space to work with. Yeah. Because to me to get low, that means my feet got to be way out here and my hands are Or you got to bend your knees more. Or and you then bend more. As you get older, them knees them don't knees bend. knees don't bend like that anymore. They bend the same, yeah. They don't do it anymore. And then, you know, same with the hips. So you bend at the hips more and, you, you know, but, and I think it took, you know, Took a toll on my low back and stuff, fitting up blocks. Right. You, know what I mean? but if you look at a guy like Aaron Donald, right? Like he could st- he could stand straight up, and he's right. You know, he's six foot. <laughs> right. You know, he slide right through there, you know, and he could use all of his power doing that. And you know, to, you know, sometimes when you're this tall, you'll get too top heavy, and you get you know you get you get you get fall over and stuff. You know, what I mean, the things things happen. You can't get your feet back underneath you quick enough. So, so did you feel like you played better against taller? Offensive linemen or guys who are about to – what do you feel? I felt like – I don't know if that had anything to do with it or not. but I, So my mentality playing was just like it didn't matter who it was. I was just going to try to win every every snap. Yeah. You know what I mean? But as far as like I'd rather have a guy that was shorter with shorter arms and, and that stuff because I could keep long him away from me. Right. You know what I mean? But them taller guys, they got long arms just as long as me or longer. So then it's like, okay, I got to change it up a little bit here because I remember the, my first, you know, welcome to the NFL moment against Joe Thomas. I was like, oh, yeah, I got him. And then I tried to get off his block, and he was like, he just, he's like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm anywhere. like, oh, you know, I can't get off the block. You know, it's like, okay, I got to start I gotta start getting their hands off me more. And that's when I was like, okay, I can't just use raw strength anymore. I got to use more, a lot more technique. Yeah. But uh, being tall, you know, batting passes and stuff, that made it nice to be able to pat, bat passes, get in a quarterback's face, you know, in his field of vision. Just being in his field of vision would screw him up, you know. So that's, that stuff is nice. Now, now okay. That's a good point. And Russell Wilson, with his height, he's not the tallest. He went the six feet, five eleven, whatever the number. He's been extremely efficient. How is he able to do that? Because, typically speaking, you think the quarterback has to be taller. What does he do? I, well, that I think that's that's how that's what they say. You know, they say that, right? But at the end of the day, you know, I used to. Brock Osweiler was six six eight six nine. I used to bat his passes more than anybody. <laughs> you know, so it's like. Did it really matter if he's tall? It's all about the way he releases that ball. If you watch his release, he just threw one. It was just his release is so high. Yeah. You know what I mean? And he, his vision, he knows where to put it. You know, he, he knows how to use his eyes to, because that's what, as a D lineman, you're looking at the quarterback's eyes and when in his hand, when his hand comes out that ball, my hand's going up. Yeah. So he knows how to get you to put your hand up and he slides it in there. You know, it was. For some quarterback, they just throw it at regard. They don't care. Who. They don't care. They just throw it. You know. So I, there's a lot of quarterbacks that were easy to bat their passes. You know. But Russell Wilson was never an easy, easy batted ball. Never. You know, you'd think him being shorter would be easy. Never. Yeah. You see the some of the outside backers there. Bradley Chubb back in the back. What, you play with Chubb, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What, what did you think about his game? And uh, you know, what does he have to do this year to have a successful year? I, he needs to stay healthy. He yeah, just needs to stay one. healthy because when he is healthy, he is a menace. Yeah. I'm talk about a freak. He's a freak of nature. His speed and power and his attitude. You know, from day one as a rookie, he was just super, I mean, just super mature. Like, way beyond his years in maturity. How so? What, like, just what? It, sometimes rookies come in, they're not ready to, they're not ready for it, you know? And, or they don't want to do what they're told. They don't want to, you know what I mean? Oh, uh, okay. But he was all about, he was coachable. He was, he was coachable, wanted to be, wanted to be great. It wasn't all about himself, you know what I mean? Celebrating was the team with his teammates. You know, he just, I think he's going to be, watch out for him. I wouldn't yeah. want to have to play against him. Yeah, oh, no. You wouldn't want to have to coach against him. He's a freak. He's a freak of nature. Randy Gregory, another good, great player. Malik yes. Reed, who people sleep on. That guy, all he does is make plays. Yes. And then Jonathan Cooper, uh, he's in the second year. The Ohio State University. And then Baron Browning moves out from the inside. 
Aaron Patrick. Yeah, he's also from uh, The Ohio State, Baron Browning, that is. Got Aaron Patrick in his second year. Nick Benito, the rookie. Uh, and then Christopher Allen, the rookie as well, out of Alabama. But uh, yeah, Nick Benito, he's our first pick of this year's draft in the third round there. So we're looking to see what he can do with the pads on. And I'm sure you've seen it. Guys come out in the mini camps without pads on. They look like superstars. And then you throw the pads on, different story. So who's this guy? Where'd he come? <laughs> you know, like, where'd the, where'd the guy from, you know, two months ago go? Yeah. You know, that's that's the thing. Now, here's the other thing. God, there's guys that you get the pads on in practice and they ball out, but then they get in a game, it's totally different. Because in practice, you know for the most part if it's going to be a pass or if it's, you know, oh, this, this is third down, you know, blitz period. Okay, yeah. they're passing the ball. You know, so you're rushing. Like, full, full so you're tip. rushing. You know, you're lining up to rush. You know, but in a game, like where's this IQ at? That's where this. That's why this game is so amazing to me. That's why these great pass rushers that know when it's going to be a pass. It's it's so much. It's so important knowing what's going to anticipating what's going to happen before the play the ball snap. Because if you just come off the ball like it's a run play and then it's a pass, then you're in trouble. You're in trouble because yeah, the far ball is coming out fast. Yeah, you got three I'm sorry, seconds. Not to field, but yeah, you. You're just standing there. Not the far line, enough up you know the field. I mean? yeah. you're not, and if it's a run play, you don't want to just blaze up the field. So you can't just rush the passer every single snap. Yeah. So it's a it's a game of it's a game of discipline and it's a game of using your brain. It's mental. It's a mental game. You know what I mean? Just as, even more so than physical. Now, who were some of the guys that you admired when you know you you watched the game? You're like, man, I, I want to be like this guy. You know, when I was a kid, my first years watching football were you know '96, '97. Wow. So Reggie White. For, oh. was like just watching the way he played I he was, was just, just like, man he had that brute strength right yeah and you know he was the minister of defense you know what I mean it was like and I you know I loved the Green Bay I loved watching the Green Bay Packers I was a big Brett Favre fan and yeah I was like I hated the Broncos did you yeah because you guys oh. beat in 97 yeah yeah in 1997 I was like I hate the Broncos yeah I was like I hate John Elway <laughs> that's how karma has it you and end up being drafted there right? yeah and then John calls me on draft day and I'm like oh shit <laughs> I thought like, you made me cry twice. <laughs> right. <laughs> Got me once. Once when I was seven. Now I'm a grown man crying. It was. Oh man, that's funny. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was pretty cool the way it happened, the way the whole thing went down. Because I, I never even talked to anybody from the Broncos except Jack Del Rio was, had a ton of conversations with him, but he hadn't have a job yet. Yeah. And then I was like, who's the D coordinator? And they're like, oh, it's Jack Del Rio. And I'm like, oh, that makes sense now. Yeah. Okay. You know, but I just like, you no, know, just young and dumb. I didn't know. I thought I was going to. Probably like Cleveland, or I thought I was going to either the Steelers or the Ravens. Really, was the two teams I thought were going to. You just never know, right? Never know in the draft. You know, know. people. I think they they uh, give you false signals. You know, thinking that one team is going to get you, and then somebody. Well, else. it's a game. Yeah. Because then they want. They, then your agent tells another guy, and then then it's like, oh, okay, it gets the heat off of this other guy, because then they start looking at me, and then they took the Steelers end up taking a guard. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> hey, so. Uh, I'll go back. I'm going to talk about the linebackers one, one for a second. Uh, Baron Brown, the edge guys, rather. Baron Browning making the transition from inside linebacker to that edge position. How difficult do you think that will be for him? It's, it's more space. That's He's going to have to close more space, space On the outside? Yeah, there's more space because you, when you're when you're interior rusher, you're right on him. You know yeah. what I mean? It's like you're fighting in a phone booth. But out there, you're getting two, three steps before you get to that guy. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's going to be – they obviously saw something – Something, something showed him that, like, oh, he can rush outside. Mm -hmm. Something showed him that. Well, he did it some at Ohio State. Um, and uh, defensive coordinator, uh, Jero Evero. Man, uh, first year as defensive coordinator. I can't imagine how much pressure that is. Uh, it looks like he's rolling with it, and he, he's like he has a great attitude. He's almost like Coach Hackett out there with the guys. Uh, I see him running around and having a good time. It looks like the guys are responding well to him. Um, what, what about for a uh, first-year defense coordinator? How do the players take to that, to, to, to a first-year defense coordinator? I mean, it's all different, you know, depending on the person, I'm sure. I'm trying to think if I ever had a first-time D, D coordinator. What, what would you imagine? What would you imagine would be like if you had a rookie uh, defense coordinator? What kind of things do you think would be challenges for that person? Getting people to buy in because you don't have a resume yet. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You're dealing with guys that – you know, resume is everything in this league. You know, what's your resume? You know, what have you done? What have you done? Yeah, and what have you done lately? Yeah. You know, nobody cares about what you did in college. Nobody cares about any of that. What have you done lately? 
Now, so. he coached the DBs. He was with the Rams last year. They, they went to the Super Bowl and won it. Uh, so I would imagine that gives you a little bit of cachet, huh? Him being – him having won a Super Bowl gives him you – know, that's he knows what it takes. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So as a D coordinator, you have to let your coaches coach. But you, and you have to let, you have to try to get people to buy into your system. Mm -hmm. It's got to be his system that they buy into. You know what I'm saying? So you, you can't try to take on somebody. He's got to be himself, no matter what. And uh, you know, you don't have to be friends with everybody. But can can he get on guys? Can can he? Can you have he push? to. You have to push guys. It's defense. We're playing defense. It's relentless after the ball football. Like playing defense is you got to be relentless. If you can make you can make a play and not and do everything wrong, but if you have good effort on that play, that's what I believe. You can still make a play. That's right. You can get dogged and pancaked, but if I get up and up, run, that's right. I can still punch a ball out. That's right. You know what I mean? Like you can get blocked by three different guys and twisted around, turn around. There've been times where I got blocked by the guard, blocked by the tackle, hit by the tight end, spun around, and oh, there's the quarterback. Bow, here's the ball. It's out. Just like that. You no, know, it's like if you just keep going, something good, good things will happen. The ball will fall into your hands and the ball will fall your way and things will happen the way they're supposed to happen because you're playing hard and doing it the right way. So that's what you got to consistently do that. And I think that I'm a strong believer, and if you want guys to play hard, they have to be afraid to be embarrassed in front of their teammates. So you got to take those – if you see – if you guys are loafing, put we're going to put this film up in front of the whole, the whole defense yep. or the whole team's going to see, and we're all going to look. You know what I mean? I think it's got to be a defensive thing, though, because doing it in front of the whole team – it kind of turns into like, it, as a D coordinator, it could make you feel like, oh, okay, he's against us. You know? Yeah, yeah, I got And you. I don't want to, and I just, I feel like that can cause division. And I, I like having like our offensive defense like competing but loving each other. You yeah. know what I mean? Because I've been on teams where it was like we hated each other, you know? Yeah. And that wasn't good. Because yeah. then it's like in the game, you're like, oh, look, I told you they were going to do that. I told you he was going to hold. Yeah, he's you should be pulling for me, man. Yeah, you're he was, my team. Yeah, you should be pulling. You want those guys to do good. You know, it's like, shit, we're trying to win football games. Right. But I think that, I think that taking, that, taking that film and being like, look, this is not this is unacceptable, and that creates that creates your players, your leaders, and your Justin Simmons. You know, Justin's got to be a, a leader on this team. He's got to be. Yes. Like he and he's got it. He's, he's got been. Was he? How much of a leader was he? He with? was. Yeah. He, just his his whole demeanor, the way he handles himself. Yes. He is. He has a, a professional. He's a true professional. Yes. He's a leader and a professional, and he doesn't have to do all that raw run, all that stuff. But when he when he when he has to, he can. You know, he's got that dog in him still. And he's consistent. And he's consistent. He's always the same person. Always the same person him. every day. Yeah. Every single day. And he and he has to be – the guys like him got to be a leader. So, if Justin comes up to you and be like, hey, man, like, I need you to – I don't want to see Logan like that. Come on. Let's, right. Let's go. And that's all you got to say to guys. And that goes a long way. You yeah. I mean? Because guys are going to look – especially young guys, they're going to look up to the guys that have been here and to the guys that have done it and the guys that have made big plays and got big contracts. And that's, what the, that's what guys – money talks in this league. So yes. if you've got a big contract, guys are going to look up to you. Yeah. That's just the way it goes because they want that contract. So they're going to do what you're doing. And a part about the, that comes with that responsibility. See, GB. Garrett Bowles there, same, same thing, is you got to be that example, right? you mm -hmm. got to go out and you got to bust your, you know, all, be all out in practice to make sure that the guys who are looking up to you, they're going to do the same thing, and you're going to be a better team yep. because of that. Super proud of this guy. Yeah. Well, hey, Derek, man, I sure appreciate you, man. Thanks this for this, this me, was man. awesome. Appreciate it. I appreciate it. Hey, we're going to kick it back over to Alexis. We're going to uh, find out a little bit more about this London raffle. Thanks so much, Steve. The Denver Broncos and Denver Broncos Charities announced the London Raffle. You guys, this is an amazing opportunity to win a five-night stay in London for the Broncos Week 8 game at Wembley Stadium up against the Jacksonville Jaguars. This includes first-class round-trip tickets for two, a behind-the-scenes experience at Broncos practice and on game day, and so much more. This trip is valued at over $22,000, and it's super easy to participate. All you have to do is go to Broncos Raffle com. The prices for these are so reasonable. One ticket for $50, three tickets for $100, eight tickets for $200, and 25 tickets for just $500. And the best part about it all, all the proceeds benefit Denver Broncos Charities. Just head to broncosraffle.com right now for a chance to win. You must be 18 or older and in Colorado to play. Well, Steve, this was an amazing moment here at, during camp today. Derek Wolf, after he left the stage, went down onto the field. Head coach Nathaniel Hackett introducing the legend himself to the team. Everybody's super excited to see him. Garrett Bowles, his former teammate, gives him a hug there. <laughs> coach Hackett with a big old bear hug. Unsurprising. Uh, coach Hackett's big on hugging, you know? Yeah, man, that's just a, a great scene. I love uh, when guys are able to 
come back and retire with the team that they played the majority of their career with, uh, go out feeling relatively healthy. You know, you guys yeah. still got some bumps and bruises and aches and that, but, uh, you know, I had a great time up here with them on stage, and uh, he's just one heck of a guy. Uh, again, great career, and I'm really happy for him. I'm glad Coach Hackett gave him an opportunity to go down and spend some time with the team as well. The players are signing autographs here after camp, of course, getting some one-on-one -on -one time with the fans who are out here. It was a hot day, and man, this was the biggest crowd that we have seen three days into camp thus far. And it's interesting, this was actually probably the lightest day of practice as well. There were four jog-through periods. So Steve, for those who might not know, what is a jog-through? Well, a jog-through is not full speed, even though they, they, don't, they don't have pads. They, they've had full speed pads where they don't have pads as well, but this particular practice, there's no pads. You're basically jogging through uh, the reps. It's more uh, of a mental process, more so than physical, but you still get a little bit, bit of a sweat in with the jogging and making sure that you're in the right place at the right time. Uh, timing definitely can't be improved during these sessions because it's not full speed, but again, just the mental side of it, making sure that you are where you're supposed to be and uh, guys know their assignments is, is the importance of that. So for the fans who are watching who are probably wondering who won the day, was it offense or defense, is it safe <laughs> to say that today is maybe not a day to really evaluate like that? I would definitely say that just because there, there's really no competition okay. uh, when, when there's a jog through because the coaches normally tell the guys, hey, I don't want anybody on the ground. Uh, you know, and, and the defenders, even if they're in position to make a play, because we saw a play that could have been intercepted, the, the, the player just backed off and uh, let the receiver catch the pass. So, right. uh, the, uh, so I would say, yeah, this, this is a draw on these types of days where it's, it's just a full uh, jog through. Yes, defensive line coach Marcus Dixon, he had said earlier, he's just looking for effort. He's looking for timing. He just wants to make sure that he's seeing these guys, you know, in the right place at the right time. Speaking of the defensive line, Derek Wolf mentioned earlier, he's a big fan of Draymond Jones. I know you're a big DJ Jones fan. We saw Mike Purcell out there as well. I mean, well, what is the potential of this defensive line? Well, they, they got a, a ton of potential, I think. I mean, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Mike Purcell. I'm a big fan of DJ Jones and Draymond Jones. I'm also anxious to see Soso get in there and do his thing as well, being yep. an Arkansas grad and that. Uh, but uh, these guys have proven that they can, can play at a high level. And, uh, you know, when they're – uh, in a system where the offense is producing points. And I, I think it's going to motivate the entire team, but uh, the interior defensive line, they'll be able to tuck their ears back a little bit more, get a chance to uh, sack the quarterback. And that's kind of like a, a treat for defensive linemen, getting the opportunity to, to rush the quarterback and get sacked. So we haven't had that as much over the last couple of years. And hopefully, again, this offense will put points on the board, and give this defensive line a chance to make some, make some plays uh, in terms of sacks and that. We see Russell Wilson and Josh Johnson out here getting some extra time, putting in some extra reps here with their wide receivers. You know, it's really easy to just spend all day every day talking about the nine-time Pro Bowler and Russell Wilson and the impact that he's having on this team. But I think something that we're not really talking about is the quarterback battle for QB2. Josh Johnson, a fantastic quarterback, but also Brett Rippon, a brilliant mind for the Denver Broncos. So what do people need to know about the QB battle there? Well, I, th I think it's going to be an interesting uh, competition as camp goes on. Uh, Josh Johnson, he's been in the league for several years. Uh, he's uh, was just in Baltimore last year backing up uh, Lamar Jackson. Um, you know, whenever you have a, a quarterback who has that mental capacity to, to – uh, you know, diagnose the game and be able to also put it in the words and uh, explain it to others, it's always a huge benefit. So, again, I, th I think all three of these guys could, could play a role at some point in this season. And, you know, the role may not be on the football field. It right. may be in terms of inspiring guys and making sure guys are doing their things and, and that they other guys understand the offense. Pretty impressive group, no doubt. Any final thoughts as we wrap things up here today, Steve? Yeah, it's, it's, it's great to see that the guys are, you know, getting a chance to jog through. And I think it's going to ramp up some tomorrow. Uh, it's going to be a fun day tomorrow. Uh, now, they won't get in the past until next week, but the intensity will certainly pick up tomorrow. I think we're right on track with where Coach Hackett wants to be at this point. Uh, the guys are still fired up. They got great attitudes, and they're flying around on the field when they can. Not today, but yep. they've been flying around, and uh, – I'm excited. I know you are, too. I'm very excited. Tomorrow is a huge day out here at the UCL Training Center. It is back together Saturday. We know this berm is going to be packed, and we know these players are going to come out 
fired up to put on a show here for Broncos country. But, you know, since you guys found this show here today, you already know that we're here capturing all of this training camp content for you each and every day. You can find Broncos training camp with Steve Atwater at 3.30 Mountain Time on the Broncos YouTube channel, DenverBroncos.com, and the Broncos 365 app each day of camp. Now be sure to join us tomorrow as former Broncos offensive lineman and two-time Super Bowl champion Mark Schlereth will be on the stage here with the Hall of Famer. Now that's all the time we have for today's edition of Broncos Training Camp 2022 with Steve Atwater for the Hall of Famer, Derek Wolf, Ryan Edwards, and everyone working behind the scenes. I'm Alexis Perry. Thank you so much for watching, and we will see you right here tomorrow.